this the, the passage I'm going to read. It, it, it's very short. Comes from chapter twenty nine, which is Waverley's reception in the Lowlands after his Highland tour. And you may remember that um, uh, he he decides that in order to clear his name, he must go back to England. Uh, he's been accused of treason, um, and uh, so. Fergus gives him a horse and gives him uh, a companion who is Callum Begg, his Highlands um, uh, bodyguard, uh, for lack of a better word. And so they go from the Highlands down into the Lowlands. We'll talk more about this section of the book later on. And Edward asks Callum Begg if it were Sunday. And Callum Begg responds, couldn't I say precisely? Sunday seldom come about the pass of Ballet Brew. Um, so uh, the question is, is it Sunday? And Callum Begg says, I don't know. <laughs> we don't mark Sunday up in, the, up in the Highlands. And it's an interesting little comic moment, I think, because when Edward is in the Highlands, he doesn't know what time it is. He doesn't know what day it is. He's, in a sense, outside of time. Um, he's in, in the Highlands, and in the Highlands, time seems to pass in a, in a different rhythm. Um, and when he comes back into the Lowlands, he enters back into a time that's measured in, in different terms. So. Um, is it Sunday today? It must be Sunday. Uh, where are we? We're in Zoom land. Uh, it's pandemic time. Uh, do we really know where we are? What time it is? It must be two o'clock. Uh, so perhaps we can begin. Um, I should I should remind you of a couple of things uh, before we start talking. One is that uh, uh, the virtual Dickens universe is going on. Uh, it began. It had its first meeting today, which was a pre-recorded session with Ryan Fong and uh, a few other people that was talking about the pairing of the two novels that were planned for this summer's Dickens Universe, David Copperfield and Iola Leroy. And uh, it will continue starting tomorrow and continuing through Friday and actually continuing on into Saturday. Uh, most of the sessions will be at 10 o'clock in the morning, Pacific Daylight Time. One of them is scheduled at 11.30, but there is a calendar, there is a schedule. And so if you want to follow those, I, I hope you will. Uh, the discussions will focus primarily on the non-Dickens text, that is to say on Iola Leroy and Francis E.W. Harper, uh, the, the, the novel that is paired with David Copperfield. So, the other thing I wanted to remind you about is the Dickens to Go uh, video series that we are sponsoring. And we are now in week six. I think tomorrow will be week seven of the Dickens to Go programs. These are short videos in which Dickens Project faculty, uh, students, and friends of the Dickens Project pick a passage, a favorite passage of theirs from Dickens, and say why they selected it. Most of them are very short. Some of them are comic passages. Some of them are serious passages. And they're just a fun way to, uh, to keep your, your toe in the world of Dickens or in the universe of Dickens during a year when we don't have a Dickens universe. Um, so I'm joined today by David Brownell. David is my co-leader for these discussions of Waverly. And one of the things that we will do a little bit differently today is that there are a few things that 
I wanted to say about Waverly that touch on um, the beginning of the novel and volume one that I didn't get around to last time, last month when we met. So I'm going to talk for 10 or 15 minutes and then I'm going to turn things over to David and David will talk for 10 minutes or 15 minutes about things that he wanted to discuss. And then after that, we'll we'll open it up for general discussion with everyone, either about the things that we have addressed or about whatever is on your mind. We've got some questions that we want to ask you about. And, um, and then just as a reminder that this is the second of three sessions on Waverly. And our final session will be next month uh, on the final Friday of final Sunday of the of the month. And um, that's the session where I wanted to talk about connections between Waverly and Sir Walter Scott on the one hand and Dickens on the other, because I think that uh, uh, Dickens was very much conscious of Scott as the uh, the, the main, 19th century writer and novelist uh, who preceded him, and that um, Dickens is writing, as we sometimes say, in the shadow of Scott, uh, uh, both admiring him and then competing with him and trying to outdo him as a, as a novelist. So anyway, that's uh, scheduled for the, uh, for the final session of our three sessions on on Waverly. So there, there are a few things that I wanted to, to pick up from uh, earlier, our earlier reading in volume one, and I'll get a little bit into, into volume two. But the first thing I wanted to talk about is heraldry. And um, heraldry is the uh, symbolic system of coats of arms. That heraldry. Heraldry, heraldry. Yes, uh, and you all know what a what a coat of arms is. It's the the family or the the clan, the ancestry marker for aristocratic families uh, in in England and indeed in other European countries. And heraldry is important in in Waverley. It's something that gets introduced at the very beginning of the novel in in chapter one. And you may remember that the narrator describes Edward as a maiden knight with a white shield. Um, and there are a couple of things that are interesting about that. One is to call him a maiden knight, uh, which feminizes him, makes him into um, uh, a knight who has not been tested. I think that's the, the general meaning implied by that. But it also feminizes him a little bit. And we might think about the way that gender operates in this novel and um, ways in which Edward is a little bit feminine. Uh, but in terms of heraldry, the thing that I wanna emphasize is the fact that he has a white shield. And a white shield means that he's not carrying a coat of arms on his shield. He's in a sense, a, a blank slate. He, he, he doesn't have he doesn't carry that uh, heraldic uh, uh, tradition or ancestry on his shield. And it, it makes him sort of a blank slate. It, uh, there, there, he will, what, what, what kind of shield will he acquire is a question that we might ask. And thinking again in terms of heraldry as a uh, symbolic system. And we actually hear a little bit more about Harold. We, we know that the Waverly family is an ancient family in England, and it does have a coat of arms. And when, uh, when Edward gets, when he's with living with um, Sir Everard, uh, he, he, there's a description of the coat of arms of the Waverly family, and it's three ermines on an azure background. Uh, ermines being a, uh, an animal, uh, and uh, uh, so he he does 
have a family coat of arms, an ancestry. And that's, that's if you will, the burden of his family history that he carries with him. And yet the narrator says that he has a, a white shield. Um, uh, 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 he, he's a blank, so to speak. But at the end of the first chapter, there's another reference to heraldry. And in, in that passage, the narrator, again, using the language of heraldry, uh, says that uh, the human heart is the same in all ages. Um, and then he, uh, that the passions of humanity remain the same, but the coloring changes according to the time in which people live. And he, he goes on to say that in the past, the color of heraldry that was used was jewels, G-U-L-E-S. And that's the color, that's a, 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 an antique name, a, an archaic name for the color red. But that now the color of uh, contemporary shields is sable, and that's black. So there has been a shift from red to black. And what he's referring to is the way in which um, legal settlements or disagreements uh, are arranged. That in the past, they were settled by war, by violence. And in the present, they're settled by law. So the question of violence and war warfare as a, 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 a dispute settlement device is um, opposed to law. And we should remember that Scott was himself trained in the law. And uh, there are characters in the novel uh, whom we meet later on who are identified with war and with the law. And so we should be careful to pay attention to scenes where legal process appears. And book two has, has a fair number of those. So I just wanted to, to emphasize that motif of heraldry and signal it as a kind of thematic motif in, in the novel. And related to that, related to the idea of uh, Edward as a knight, a maiden knight with a white shield, is a related theme that I wanted to call attention to. And it's something that, that I um, signaled a little bit last month when we were talking about the milk cows. And I said, what's the purpose of the milk cow uh, incident in the novel? And one answer is that it was a device to get uh, Edward up into the highlands, uh, the theft of the, of the milk cows. But the real question is, whose device is it? And uh, the answer that I suggested is that it's Fergus's device. That Fergus arranges with Donald Bain Lane, the, um, the, the, the uh, thief of the cavern, the, the bandit, the raider, to steal the Baron's milk cows, and then to send Evan Dew, the Highlander dressed in his Highland outfit, to invite Edward to come up into the Highlands uh, in search of the milk cows. And um, I, I think what's interesting about that is that Fergus is trying to write something on the white shield of Edward. And the novel has a lot of what I like to think of as internal plotters. That is, people who are trying to write Edward's story for him. And when you start counting them up, there, there's just a multitude of people who are trying to write Edward's story. Edward, in a sense, doesn't have a story. He's, he's that maiden knight with the white shield. Um, and his mind is full of the uh, romances the, uh, uh, that he has read, the medieval stories of knighthood, but his mind is also full of those family myths, the, the stories that he has heard as a boy uh, growing up in a family that has a long 
tradition and that has a coat of arms. And so the family coat of arms is something that is connected with a set of stories. But think about all the people who are trying to write Edward's story for him. Um, uh, there's his own father. Uh, his own father is trying to write a story uh, for Edward. And one of the um, chapter titles, chapter titles are always interesting in, in this novel, is called The Choice of a Profession. Um, what is the choice of profession? Uh, Edward's profession is to be a soldier. But who makes the choice? Uh, it's not Edward who makes the choice. <laughs> it's his father. And you may remember that the plan was, uh, Sir Everard's plan for, uh, for Edward was to send him on the grand tour. It's gonna send him to Europe in the company of his tutor, Mr. Pembroke. Um, and then his father, Edward's father, Richard, who's a Whig in the Whig government back in London, hears about this and uh, mentions it to a minister in uh, the, the government. And they recognize that it would be a bad idea for Edward to go on a grand tour of Europe, because if he does that, and if he goes to France, he's going to meet the people who are Jacobites. He's going to meet the, uh, the opposition. So the Whig ministers say, why don't you um, uh, turn him into a soldier in the English army, and we'll send him to Scotland. Um, so the choice of Edward's career is not a choice that he makes or that he initiates. And, and they promote him. Edward has no military training or, or background. We know, in fact, uh, from what happens later on, that he's a pretty poor soldier. Uh, but uh, they promote him uh, to a captain and uh, put him at the head of a, uh, a group of cavalry that's composed of people from uh, Sir Everard's estate, and uh, they sent him up to, to Scotland. So um, Edward is in the employ, his career is to be in the employ of the government in London. And that's a career choice for him. It's, it's a story that is being written for him. And it's a story that's being written against another story that could be written for him which is the story that he might, uh, in fact, become a Jacobite sympathizer. So his father is writing a story for him. And there's even, I, I would suggest that th there, there's maybe another way in which his father is writing a story for Edward. Um, do you remember how Edward comes to live with his uncle, his uncle, Sir Everard, his father's older brother? Um, and uh, when Edward is a little boy, he's out with his nurse and he sees the carriage of his uncle and it has the family coat of arms on it. And Edward, as a young boy, is attracted to that coat of arms. And he and his nurse wait for uh, the owner of the carriage to come back and it's Sir Everard and Sir Everard recognizes Edward as his nephew and invites him to come and live with him. And uh, Sir Everard uh, takes him in. So how does it happen that uh, Edward with his nurse happens to be out in the place where Sir Everard's carriage happens to be passing by? I think that and it's hard to prove because we don't have any conclusive evidence, but I would suggest that uh, Edward's father, Richard, wants his son, Richard's son, that is Edward, to be in the good graces of his uncle because his uncle has a wealthy estate and um, uh, Edward could only stand to benefit by being closely associated with his, with his uncle. So I think there's even another plot that's being prepared for Edward, which is to become closely associated with with his uncle. But think about all the other people who are writing uh, stories, writing plots for Edward's life to put on his blank shield. Um, Mr. Pembroke, for example, wants Edward to be 
a, a high church enthusiast um, and tries to indoctrinate him into the uh, uh, belief system of the Anglican church. Uh, Miss Rachel, his, uh, his, his aunt, is, uh, is someone who has a story for Edward that she's preparing, which is, and that's the story of the family history of uh, the Civil War and how the Waverly family uh, soldiers were all on the side of the monarchy and opposed to, the, uh, to Cromwell and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the roundheads who were, uh, and, and who were the opponents of, of Charles I. And uh, uh, so she's writing a story for Edward and she wants to teach him all the family, all the family history. And then of course, when he gets up into the Highlands, Fergus is writing a story for him. Fergus, Fergus has, got, ha has hatched this plot to steal the milk cows, to send Evan Dew, to bring Edward up into the Highlands, to um, lure him away from his duties as a soldier in the English army. Um, one of the scenes that, uh, that I really like, it's at the very beginning of uh, volume two, is the stag hunt scene. And you remember that Edward, again, he's, he's very unaware of what's happening to him. He, his story is being written for him by other people, and he's not aware of that fact. Um, so he thinks it's a stag hunt. He thinks that this gathering of the of the clans uh, in the Highlands is uh, is a, is a stag hunt. And what he doesn't realize is that it's a preparation for the invasion and the uh, the rebellion, the Jacobite rebellion that is to follow. But there's a moment in the um, in the stag hunt that is uh, is I think easy to miss if you just read straight past it, if you read with Edward's eyes. And you remember that in uh, one moment in the stag hunt, that the deer are being chased by the beaters. The, the deer are out in the, in the woods and they come running uh, to the area where the uh, Highlanders are separated. And Fergus calls out to everyone. And he calls out in Gaelic. And what he says is, watch out, get out of the way. <laughs> but Edward doesn't understand Gaelic. And so the, <laughs> the stags come and he gets run over or he gets knocked over in uh, the moment. And if you read carefully, you'll see that, um, that all the Highlanders laugh at that moment because what has happened is that Fergus has uh, created a practical joke at Edward's expense. He wants the other uh, 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 Highlanders to be aware that Edward doesn't know what he's doing up there. And then what happens is that Edward actually gets injured. He get, he, he's, um, and later on he has a fever and he gets treated by a, a, a Highland um, doctor, physician, um, healer, and um, so it turns into something more serious. They didn't mean for Edward to get hurt, but the point of all of this, the deep plot, is not just to pull a practical joke on Edward. It's that Fergus saves Edward's life. He has created a situation in which the practical joke is going to put Edward in danger, and Fergus is then going to be able to save Edward's life or make Edward believe that he has saved his life. And that means that Edward is forever indebted to, to Fergus for having saved his life. So again, it's part of a very deep plot that is operating. Um, who else is, is writing a story for Edward? Um, Flora is writing a story for, for Edward. And Flora has a little bit different agenda from, uh, from Fergus. Fergus is a politician. Fergus simply wants to bring Edward into the Jacobite rebellion because 
he wants to use Edward as a pawn to induce other English aristocrats and families of Jacobite sympathizers in England to join the rebellion once the prince has arrived. So it's a purely practical uh, uh, motive. And we know that Fergus as a politician stands to gain a lot uh, from this. Fergus, Fergus wants to become an earl. Um, and Fergus is uh, a, a leader of a Highland clan. But at the same time, he's been brought up in France. He speaks French. He's familiar with French poetry. Uh, he's a culturally sophisticated person. He's not a Highlander who has never left the Highlands. And, and Fergus is aware of international politics in a way that, well, Flora also is someone who's been raised in, in, in France, but Flora is more of an idealist. Flora believes deeply in the cause. Flora is the true fanatic. Flora is the one who, when Edward is um, seems to be in love with her and wants to make a proposal to her, says, no, uh, you have to treat me as a friend. Um, I don't want you to join the rebellion because you think you're in love with me. I want you to join the rebellion because you're a true believer. And so uh, she, she is the, the true idealist. She wants Edward to join the rebellion but for slightly different reasons than, than Fergus does. So uh, Flora is, if you will, she's a fanatic. She's a true believer in the cause. And uh, Fergus is not a true believer in the cause for its own sake. Fergus is the shrewd politician. So, but both of them are trying to uh, write a story for Edward, that is to, to put something on his, his, his blank shield. Um, so uh, Miss Rachel is doing it, Mr. Pembroke is doing it, uh, Richard, uh, Richard Waverley, Edward's father is doing it. Uh, who, who isn't doing it? Um, I don't think that Sir Everard is trying to write the story for Edward. Uh, I don't think that the Baron is trying to write, at least not to the same degree that these these other plotters are are doing it. And uh, uh, the 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 in, it's the internal plotters who are trying to to write Edward's story. And when I say to the, the, that there's a there's a plot that is being hatched for Edward, it's really a deep plot. It's not just a, a story about Edward's life and what Edward is going to do with his, his life. What they're trying to do, if at the deepest level, is to write history. They're, they're trying to write, the, rewrite the past and to write the future. So his father is trying to write the story of the Whig government, of the succession of the Protestant monarchy. And what Flora and Fergus are trying to do is to rewrite the history that would reinscribe the Stuart monarchy as uh, uh, the, the true monarchy. And the contest between those two uh, histories, if you will, is at the root of what is going on in the novel Waverly. And you might even look back um, you don't have to do it now, but uh, the novel has an epigraph. And the epigraph comes from Shakespeare's play, Henry IV. And the quotation that Scott uses is, under which King Bizonian? And that's really the, the historical issue that is at stake in the novel, is under which king, um, under which historical dispensation will the future unroll. Now, of course, in a historical novel, and Waverly is, if not the very first, it's the most celebrated uh, and the one that's often cited as the beginning of the historical novel. Um, 
because it's set 60 years in the past, earlier than the time when it's written, we as readers of it and all the contemporary readers know how it turned out. We know, <laughs> we know how, how history uh, turned out. We know who won that, that struggle. Um, so in a sense, it's, it's not a surprise, but what we are witnessing is the struggle of people in a time 60 years ago who are trying to control the future. So as we read the novel, if we read it as contemporary readers of Waverley in 1814, we are reading about our own struggle to understand how the past shapes the present and determines the future. And we're also reading about our own place in history. What is our role? What's the life of the individual in relation to the struggle for control of history, the past, and history as something that will point to and lead to the future in which we are heading. So there's one other thing I wanted to talk about in relation to this set of themes. And it's, it, I started with heraldry, uh, then I talked about internal plotters, people who are trying to write the, the story of Edward's life for him. And the last thing that I, I wanted to talk about in my little opening um, is the place of fathers in the novel. And uh, this is a novel that it, it, it does have some female characters and they're important female characters. And we should talk about Flora and, and Rose later on. And there's some minor female characters as well. Um, but it's largely a male world. It's, it's largely a male of fathers. And you could say that the story of Edward Waverley is a story about the search for a father. He's, in a sense, he's not literally an orphan. His mother dies early, and so she's, she's not part of the story. He's raised by, by men. He's raised, sort of, by his father, and then by his, his uncle. And then he's taken under the wing of the Baron of Bradwardine. Um, and then by Fergus and in the Highlands, it's a patriarchal society. It's a male dominated society. Um, uh, but uh, you could say that uh, Edward is searching for a father. He's not completely aware of that uh, because as we've said, Edward is not completely aware of a lot of things. Edward is, Edward's kind of out of it, uh, which is part of his charm. Um, and it's also part of what makes him a useful character to have at the center of, of a novel like this. But insofar as we think of uh, Waverley as a Bildungsroman, that is uh, a novel about the growth and development of its protagonist, its central character, we could say, and I think it's an accurate uh, statement, that he is in search of and in need of a father. And it's in part because his own father has abandoned him. He's, he's in that sense, a kind of pseudo orphan. His father is backed out of the picture and turned over the role of father to the uncle for reasons that may be strategic. Um, but in any event, uh, Sir Everard is more of a father to Edward than uh, his own father, Richard Waverley, has been. And then Sir Everard, after uh, Edward gets uh, inducted into the military and gets sent to Scotland, turns him over to the Baron of Bradwardine. And the Baron of Bradwardine is also very much a, a father figure for, for Edward. Um, and uh, then uh, Edward goes up into the Highlands. And in the Highlands, the search for a father takes on a slightly different um, coloring, if you will. And we might at, at first say that, that Fergus is a father figure, but I don't think that's quite right. Fergus is, and at one point he, he actually says something close to this, that um, I think he's an older brother to, to Edward. He's, he's, he's a role model, uh, he's, uh, 
uh, an icon of a certain form of um, leadership and masculinity and um, heroism of a, of a certain sort. Um, and, but I don't think he's a father figure for, for Edward. And the reason that I, I emphasize brother rather than father is that what, what Fergus wants to do is to bring Edward into the clan, the clan of the MacIvers. And the real father, you, you do understand what the name MacIver means. It means son of Ivor. That is, they are members, the MacIvers and the MacIvers clan are those who wear the MacIver tartan and who are sons of Ivor. Ivor is the ancestor. So Ivor, the mythic father and founder of the clan, is the true father. And the MacIvers are all sons. So what Fergus wants to do is to make Edward into a brother, into a, a clan member. And if he manages to do that, then he will have succeeded in getting him into this mythic patriarchal body of brothers who are all followers of Ivor, the, the mythic clan founder and father. There's at least one other father that um, needs to be mentioned. And uh, this is a father who doesn't figure as prominently in volume one, but he does come into greater prominence in volume two. And that's Colonel Gardner. And Colonel Gardner is the leader of the, um, I'm gonna get my military terms uh, um, uh, mixed up here, but the battalion, the larger, group, the larger body of English troops in the Highlands. And Cap uh, Colonel Gardner is a senior officer. He's the, the man who is in charge. And he's the one who writes Edward the letters that says, you've overstayed your leave in the Highlands. You need to report back to duty. And Edward, of course, resents getting these letters because he doesn't like to be addressed by someone who assumes the right to have authority over him. Um, and uh, so what we, what we witness there in a fairly mild form, but one that has deep consequences, is a little bit of, um, I think, what I think we can call Oedipal uh, reaction. That Edward is a son who's, who's used to having a fair amount of independence and freedom to come and go as he wants. Um, that's what Sir Everard has given to him. Sir Everard is not a strict father. Neither is the Baron of Bradwardine. That's why I think they're not the principal father figures, although they, they have a little bit of the, the father, uh, protector father, uh, the benign father uh, in them. Um, but Colonel Gardner assumes the role of the strict father, the father who threatens Edward with um, uh, expulsion, if you will, from his position in the English army if he doesn't report back to duty. And so we see Edward a little bit in rebellion. But again, to think back in terms of the history of, uh, of the historical background, there there are two other fathers, um, or maybe maybe three. I'm, tr I'm going to try and uh, link them together. But under which king, Bizonian? Um, the ultimate father is the king. That is, there's George II, and there's Charles Edward, or the old pretender and the young pretender. Um, and Charles Edward is uh, the prince who has, has landed and who's going to lead the, uh, the rebellion, is a kind of father uh, to Edward. And um, we see the contest that is taking place is a contest between a man who would be king and a king who's entirely absent from the novel, but whose authority 
lies behind uh, Richard Waverley and um, uh, ultimately uh, is the, the father, the, the authority who lies behind the Whig government, a kind of symbolic father, if you will, not a father in the flesh so much. But anyway, the, the, the point I'm trying to make with all of these remarks is that Edward's life story, which is being plotted for him by other people, and which uh, in, in heraldic terms is about the inscription of a coat of arms onto the blank shield that uh, Edward is given at the, in the very first chapter of the novel, is really a story about plotting history. It's a struggle to control history. It's about the struggle to write history or to rewrite history that's taking place in terms of the uh, search for a father and the identification, the sort of deep identification of who the father figures are in the novel. Now, the case of Captain Gardner becomes more prominent in volume two because there's the moment where uh, Edward witnesses first a scene that he takes as parasite as the killing of the father. And then um, that doesn't take place. And then at a later point, Colonel Gardner is killed in the Battle of Preston Pans. And Edward is forced to uh, witness that, that, that scene of patricide, of parricide. Um, and when it happens, he imagines that Colonel Gardner has looked at him uh, as if Edward is the one who is responsible for, for the death of Colonel Gardner. So the struggle to find a father and the resistance to the father and the identification with a father, becoming a son, uh, becoming a MacIver or not becoming a MacIver, these are all important scenes in the novel. And um, so uh, those are the things I wanted to say uh, for starters. So I'm going to ask David. David now uh, has a chance to say some things that uh, he wanted to tell us about uh, uh, moments in volume two and um, the historical background of the novel. So I'll turn things over to David. David, are you there? I'm here. Okay. Uh, I'm going to do some heavy generalizing, and I hope if I say things that are absolutely untrue, that you will correct me when we get to the questions. I'm figuring um, a plan that can keep me honest on history. Uh, where I started was with uh, Edwards being conveyed by gifted Gilfillan's Cameronians. And I wanted to look at who the hell are they and why are they in the book? Uh, we'll get to the answer in a very roundabout way. Uh, I think Scott inevitably in writing this book had in mind Tom Jones, Fielding's novel that came out in 1749, which is set in England during the Jacobite Rebellion. Tom crosses England in the midst of all the agitation that's going on. At one point, he gets mistaken for the young pretender. And Fielding gives you a sort of cross section of what England was like at the time. And I think Scott had this as a model, and he's trying to show you what Scotland was like at the time. So we get Edward's interaction with the blacksmith and the other villagers and with the Cameronians and so on. Another way in which this book is like Tom Jones is that Scott, like Fielding, gives you these little essays at the beginning of each book. Uh, 
Okay. In a way, the Jacobites and the Cameronians are both unhappy with the way things came out in the 17th century and are trying to upset the way those outcomes ended up. Uh, the 17th century is extremely bloody and messy in both Great Britain and in Europe. Uh, in Europe, you have the Thirty Years' War, in which about a third of the population of, of the German states were killed. Uh, what's going on in all these disturbances, battles, massacres, and whatnot? is very largely about religion. Uh, everybody had religious opinions. Everybody was sure that his opinions were right and that therefore everyone else should be forced to live by them. This is uh, a turn of thought that has not entirely gone away. Very few historical uh, ideas ever do vanish. The religion is also tied up with the politics very intimately. Start with James VI of Scotland, who came to England as James I. When he arrived among his baggage, he had two of the books he'd written in which he was instructing his children on how to be king. He states very strongly the theory of the divine right of kings. God made you a king and put you in place, and it's everybody's duty to obey you because otherwise they're disobeying God. This comes out of a long, long tradition of hierarchical thought going back to the Middle Ages. Uh, was more popular as a belief with those who were on the top of the of the heap rather than those on the bottom. But the idea was that uh, God wanted the king to be in charge. This idea is not entirely gone. I have noticed that some uh, members of the evangelical persuasion in our time are saying that they think God wanted Trump to be president. I don't remember them saying that about Obama, but maybe I missed it. Uh, anyhow, you find a good statement of this great chain of, beer, of being in Shakespeare's Troilus and Cressida and Ulysses speech in the Greek Council and on order and hierarchy. Part of the whole background of, of this theory was that God had created the world and as his final uh, climactic creation had created mankind. Mankind was put on Earth. Earth was at the center of the solar system with the sun and the moon and the planets and the stars all revolving around Earth. Man was terribly, terribly important. This world picture was springing a lot of leaks by this time as astronomy developed and was given up very reluctantly by, for example, uh, the Catholic Church. Uh, which, uh, like so many of us, is reluctant to say, well, you know, I was totally wrong on that. Uh, even within this orderly hierarchical picture, there were disputes. To begin with, the kings tended to say, I am God's vicar on earth. The popes said, hey, wait a moment here. I am God's vicar on earth. You have a long history 
over a number of centuries of conflicts between kings and popes, uh, who got to tell whom what to do, who got to appoint the bishops and the abbots, uh, who got the revenue. That was unresolved and I suppose still isn't really resolved. The, a number of people think they have ultimate authority who may not. Uh, one part of the divine right of kings was the theory of legitimacy. Uh, when the king died, his oldest son would succeed. It was important to keep the crown in the same family uh, with legitimacy. This got challenged a lot in the French Revolution, but at the settlement after that in 1815 at the Congress of Vienna, uh, the settlement upheld legitimacy pretty much in the European states. Okay, one other part of the divine right of kings was the, pretty much undisputedly, the king got to tell his subjects what their religion was. Uh, this occasionally resulted in confusions if a change of monarchs also involved a change of religion. In England alone, you go from Henry VIII, who got and got titled as defender of the faith by the Pope, then discarded the Pope and became head of the church himself, but kept the title. And he presided over a somewhat Protestant Catholicism with himself as the head. When he died, his son Edward VI was in power fairly briefly. That was much more extreme Protestant. When he died, his half-sister Mary, known as Bloody Mary, came to the throne and tried to restore Catholicism. Over 300 uh, people died as a result of her prosecution of Protestantism. Uh, a lot of them burned at the stake. When she died, Elizabeth came to the throne and she tried to uphold a moderate Protestantism. Uh, basically, Elizabeth would let you believe what you wanted as long as you didn't say in public that she was a bastard and didn't have the right to be queen. When we get to James and then to his son, Charles I, they're trying to be administratively tidy. They're king in Scotland and king in England, but they're presiding over dis different systems and different laws and different church, church establishments. So uh, Charles and his Archbishop of Canterbury, William Laud, were trying to standardize practice. The Scots did not like this at all. Uh, a lot of the trouble started, Charles was ruling without calling a parliament because he didn't think you should have people who were trying to tell the king what to do. So he and Lord came up with a new prayer book for Scotland. The Scottish bishops had input on it, but the Scots resisted violently. They did not think that they should be told to use a prayer book that had not been approved by the Scottish Parliament or by the Scottish General Assembly of the Church. So they rebelled. They put together an army and the king put together a makeshift army. The Scottish army had a lot of veteran soldiers who'd been fighting in the Thirty Years' War and were professionals. The king's makeshift army got shattered 
now Charles had to call Parliament because he needed money and all the issues that had been under the carpet were brought up and all hell broke loose. Civil wars with a large number of parties. You think of a civil war as having one side and the other side. This one had multiple sides between the various religious opinions and the Scots, the Royalists, the Parliamentarians, and later the Cromwell's army. Uh, much too much stuff. Uh, the Scots put out what they called the National Covenant, which came out in 1638. Thousands of Scots signed copies of this. It was a real national movement, partly coming out of Scottish nationalism. And it was against personal rule and the king's use of the royal prerogative. One of the preachers called it the glorious marriage day of the kingdom with God. And the Scots religiously tended to identify themselves with the Jews in the Bible as being chosen people. So the Scots General Assembly met, the King's Lord High Commissioner tried to dissolve it and was voted down. Uh, the Covenanters split among themselves. The extreme side wanted to depose the King and put power uh, in Parliament. Parliament came out with the Solemn League and Covenant in 1643, which is what the Cameronians are wanting to get back to. The idea was to have a single Presbyterian church on the Scottish model imposed in England, Scotland, and Ireland. Remember, I told you everyone thought he was right and wanted to impose his opinions on others. So there's a period in Scotland uh, referred to as the rule of the saints in which the covenant, the extreme covenanters were in, in power for some years. Uh, here's somebody's summary of it. Some historians have depicted the rule of saints as a totalitarian, almost Stalinist state, but that is probably going too far. It was certainly a bad time for anyone high or low who indulged in sexual misdemeanors or was suspected of witchcraft, however arbitrarily. On the other hand, for many Scots, clergy and laity alike, the rule of saints represented the high point of the Reformation when Kirk and the state were purged of impurities. Indeed, in the period after the Restoration and on into the 18th century, the people who saw themselves as the spiritual descendants of these revolutionary covenanters always hearkened back to this as a golden age. They claimed that the only people who were in, uh, unhappy in Scotland at that time were sinners because they were so discouraged from going on sinning. So that's the Cameronians, they're, they're leftover covenanters. The point came in Scotland where Cromwell, who by now was running the army and very powerful in the English state, decided that this was something up with which they were not going to put. He came to Scotland with his army. I have not sought these things. Truly, I have been called on to them by the Lord, and therefore am not without some assurance that he will enable his poor worm and weak servant to do his will and fulfill his generation. 
he appealed to the General Assembly of Scotland to put off this coming war. Is it therefore infallibly agreeable to the word of God, all that you say? I beseech you in the bowels of Christ, think it possible you may be mistaken. This did not uh, cut any ice with the uh, covenanters. So the covenanters had been purging their army of officers and men that they thought were insufficiently zealous. And they were ready to fight a battle with Cromwell. They had a position that was so strong that Cromwell wouldn't attack it. Cromwell thought he had fewer men that he could not win without almost a miracle. The miracle came. Uh, the religious commissars, the ministers who were superintending the army's operations, insisted that the Scots forsake their high position and descend the plain for a biblical pitched battle, what they called going down against the Philistines at Gilgal. Cromwell watched the Scottish army come down to the plain and said, the Lord hath delivered them into our hand. He attacked and it was a disaster. 4,000 Scots were dead or wounded, 10,000 were prisoners, only 4,000 escaped. The prisoners were marched south to slavery in the salt mines in England or in the new plantations overseas. Cromwell saw this as a God-given victory. The ministers said it was the defeat was God's proper punishment for the misdeeds of the Stuart dynasty. Uh, we've seen other leaders who didn't take personal responsibility for misfortunes they'd caused. Uh, okay, the Cameronians got their name from Richard Cameron, who was one of the extreme preachers. After they became, after they lost power, they mostly continued their operations by having meetings in the fields, conventicles, and Richard Cameron was a fiery preacher, very successful. So I think one of the reasons Scott brings the Cameronians into Waverley is he's trying to give you a cross section of what was going on in Scotland. Scott's attitude towards the Cameronians is interesting. To me. I think Scott, after all, grew up in the 18th century. And a lot of the 18th century attitude towards religion was the result of the bloodshed of the 17th century. There were an awful lot of people in, in power in England whose general attitude was, we've been there and we don't want to go there again. Uh, a real pejorative in 18th century England in talking about religion was the term enthusiasm. This was a bad thing. Religious enthusiasts had no sense of when enough was enough. And I think Scott is somewhat distressful, is more than a little distrustful of the Cameronians and all these people who refused to allow facts 
and common sense to temper their conduct. I'll stop there. I think I've gone on quite long enough and it's probably time that we should get to the questions. Do you want to handle this, John, or do you want to have sure, it? Sure, sure. Um, so uh, why don't I, I just in, invite any of you who have questions, either about what David has said or what I said earlier, um, to bring up a topic, to ask a question, uh, and the only restriction is that let's stick to volume two of the novel uh, and not give away anything that is beyond that or refer to anything that is beyond um, the, uh, the battle scene with which volume two concludes. So does anyone have a question? I see Glenna's hand coming up. So Glenna, speak. Unmute yourself. You need okay. to unmute. Yeah. It's not so much a question as a comment that I had, being an American historian, I've read a lot about the uh, affinity between Southern slaveholders in Scott's novels. And it was in this section of Waverly that I really got it because, um, you know, this is, after all, a retrograde cause that they're fighting for. These, the Whigs are in favor of a constitutional monarchy. These people want to go back to the divine right of kings kind of thing. And yet it's made, I mean, not, I'm not talking about Scott, but you can see the framework of the thinking of the Highlanders and the Jacobites as, uh, oh, it's a noble cause. and. You know, we don't know whether they're going to win or not, but it's so noble and it kind of obscures the retrograde nature. And I just think it's really, it just really came to me that this is the lost cause out of a mentality of the American South. And as I say, this was an, ad, I even went back and looked, there's a book called Cavalier and Yankee that was written in the 60s uh, about the affinity between the American South and uh, you know, the, the Cavaliers and the Puritans who settled New England with the Roundheads and so on. But this section of this novel brought it home to me. Um, you, you may know the famous quotation, I can't, I can't get it exactly, but uh, Mark Twain claimed that it was Sir Walter Scott who caused uh, the American Civil War because he led uh, Southern slaveholders to uh, believe that theirs was a lost, a noble cause, a lost cause. And um, in Huckleberry Finn, the steamboat that runs down the road and Jim are on is called the Sir Walter Scott. Um, so uh, you're, you're, you're right that there was a deep identification between uh, the elite class in the American South as a um, as believers in a, a way to to turn history back to to move to move back retrograde as a retrograde force um, and uh, um, uh, whether you know the the question that it then raises is where where do we think Scott is in relation to this Scott is is blamed uh, sometimes for having um, led people to believe in the nobility of the Jacobite cause. And uh, what, what in fact do people think Scott's politics, or to be more precise, the, the politics of the narrator? Who's, whose side is the narrator on? Where can, we, can, we, can we locate the, a political stance or a political belief or a political ideology? Uh, with the narrator of Scott's novel. I don't want to call it Scott precisely, but the narrator in this novel. Glenna or anyone else. Uh, well, I'm, I mean, I was struck by it that there's this one moment uh, toward the end of this section where um, just anticipation, the, the battle before the battle, 
we don't get to the real battle, um, I guess, until the next section. But, uh, and Edward is witnessing the engagement and he sees the Highlanders through the eyes of the English, you know, that they're wild and he's wondering, what the heck am I doing here? And all of a sudden, it's like this kind of completely different point of view than you have seen up to this point intrudes itself. And that makes me question how complete the, the um, identification with the narrator is with the, uh, the noble Jacobite cause. Mm -hmm. I say that I didn't see any identification with the Jacobite cause on Scott's part at any point really in the novel. Uh, I saw him poking holes in the whole idea, you know, through all the way through. Uh, I, you know, it seemed to me it, it was very much coming from a moderate English point of view, uh, you know, if you like, a, a middle of the road Anglican point of view, and not at all sympathetic to either the extreme views of people like the Cameronians, the, the Covenanters, or the uh, uh, the Catholic influence clans like Ferguses uh, and Lochiel, who started, who were the le main leaders of the Bonnie Prince Charlie's uh, um, troops. So I didn't get the impression at all anywhere through the novel that he was, he thought it was other than a great pity, if you like. And if you like, you may see it as a pity because of what happened afterwards, and we'll go into that later. But uh, you know, I think it, he saw it as being like the fighting and the horrors of the 17th century being continued into the 18th century because people were putting religion uh, on such a high, you know, extremes of religion and insisting on other people agreeing with them and that, that was what the problem was. Scott was conservative in his politics in spite of being a member of the first generation of romantic poets in England, but he was, he was moderate. I, I think you're exactly right, Irene, that it is from a moderate viewpoint. Do, do other people have views on this? It, it's, I think it's a, a complicated situation. Um, and uh, I, I, I would just, I'll, this, a quote that I will, um, uh, give you. It is the object of this history to do justice to all men, uh, the narrator says at one point. So uh, the narrator claims at that particular point that his goal is to be fair, uh, to, to be just to all men. So to what extent is he being just to uh, the Highlanders, to uh, the prince, to Bonnie Prince Charlie, uh, to Fergus, uh, to Flora, for example. There are many people who, who came away from this novel thinking that Flora was the most admirable character in the entire novel. Um, she's a heroine for uh, writers like George Eliot, and, um, you know, one of the strong, admirable women in, in Scott's novels. So what do other people think? This is not to disagree with Irene, but... Uh, um, simply to add another dimension to the discussion. John, Ann has her hand raised. Okay, please. Well, it seems to me that one way in which um, Scott invites the reader in is through the narrator, who's always calling attention to the reader, and invites us early on in the first volume to join um, along on the stagecoach ride, and in fact, often cause attention to the narrator as the one who's actually leading the narrative throughout. So there's a way in which I think that Scott's inviting readers to go along with Waverly, who is, as you pointed out earlier, uh, wavering back and forth. He has an open view toward all the encounters, whether it's the different countrysides, moving from England to the lowlands to the highlands. And uh, likewise, he, thus far, he seems to be very open to the different uh, parties he encounters, he seems as interested in learning about them as he is uh, much more so than being judgmental about them. So there's a way in which Scott allows the reader to position him or herself 
um, along with Waverly as a learner during the journey, sort of a, a reader's building roman in a way, building's roman. Um, anyway, I think, I think the narrator leaves the reader lots of options rather than trying to be dogmatic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, th I think it's, it's very good to call attention to the role of the reader and the way in which the reader is positioned by the narrator. Um, and the narrator often focalizes or uses the, the perspective or the point of view of Edward. And Edward, as we have discussed, is someone who's, um, who's young and inexperienced and who's learning and who's impressionable and whose impressions get shaped in one direction and get shaped in another direction. And so to the extent that we go along with Edward, we are learning about Scotland at the same time and seeing it through perhaps idealized eyes because Edward, remember, has been formed by the reading that he, he has done in the past. But that's not to say that Edward's perspective is any kind of final perspective. So the narrator is both uh, with Edward and causing the reader to be with Edward, but also at a distance and um, perhaps more uh, experienced and more judgmental in ways that Irene is is mentioning. So. David, go ahead. You're, I see you. Yeah. Okay. In rereading the book this time, it seemed to me, particularly in book two, that the narrator, the the way it, the story is told, is much more sophisticated than I'd noticed in the past. In book two, instead of the summaries about Edward that we got in book one, an awful lot of what shapes your opinion of Edward happens in things other people say to or about him. For example, when Flora turns down his proposal, she comments that he's seen very little of the world, which is an awfully polite way of saying, <laughs> boy, you're young and inex inexperienced, you're too small, I'm gonna throw you back. Yep. Mm -hmm. any, any other um, comments? Uh, and Tara, yes, please uh, help me to call on people whose hands I don't see, so go I ahead. I know that, that, Brad, um, that Brad wanted to respond as well to the same question. Yes. Uh, hi, hi, everyone, I had a, I love this, this is great, this is great. Um, I had a question though, that's a little more rhetorical, um, you know, we look at this novel in a time where um, we have the benefit of so much more science now than when people of that time did. Um, we, have, we have so much more probably exposure to intellectual ideas than many of those people did in that time. And we talk about the movement of people in their service to God as if it's a cover for political action a lot of the time, because I think many people perhaps see it that way now. I, I wonder if, if, there, if any of us or any of you believe that the participants in this particular struggle, uh, if you believe any of them were actually trying to fulfill their destinies, if you will, in their service to who they thought was their God and who was actually who they or who or what they thought was the organizer of their experience on this earth. Um, I, I mean, I think that changes, I think that changes our, our desire to fight to the death if we know that if our cause is not sufficient, that there will be no reason for us to go on because our God will not have been honored or, or carried forward. I, I just wonder, I know we're talking a lot about these things. I know that's a little bit esoteric, but, but I, I can't help but think that that must have been a very important aspect of life in those times that just is totally absent from our experiences now, or many of us anyway. Um, can you say more about what you think of the, people in this book. Can you answer your own question? Well, it's very political. 
as as you pointed out um it, it's 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 fascinatingly political and and intricately intellectual um and 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 i i believe there are always self the question would be self-interest or I, I would guess that you could ultimately lay the lay the crossroads at self-interest versus interest of of our of our communal experience of our society of our world of our collective um the kirk i think someone said um aligning the kirk with with the politics um i'm not sure that i feel that we're giving adequate deep recognition to the spiritual quest that, that I think is under many people's concerns in the book. I guess that's what I think. Or, or they're represented as characters rather than true believers. I, I would say, in, it, it, first of all, it's, it's a very good question and it's, it's I think useful for us to try and put ourselves to the extent that we can back into the frame of mind of the characters who are represented in, in the novel. And I think that um, we need to distinguish among the characters in the novel, that there are some who are genuinely dedicated to a cause that they believe in and are willing to make deep sacrifices for. And I think that Flora is, an example of such a person in the novel. That Flora is dedicated to a higher cause, which is for her a religious principle that she's prepared to die for. And I think Flora is represented in the novel as, uh, as admirable to a very considerable extent. Flora has a grotesque and comic, but comic in a, in a kind of awful um, way, counterpart in the novel. And that's the wife of the blacksmith whom uh, Edward quarrels with when he goes into uh, the lowlands. You remember he gets into a quarrel with the blacksmith, the shoe, you know, the horse has lost its shoe. And that woman um, screams, Charlie over the water, Charlie over the water, and she's a harridan, and she's a shrew, and she uh, implies that her a uh, child is not the child of her husband, and she's a kind of harpy, an awful figure. Um, but that's a caricature of the kind of fanaticism that Flora represents in an ideal mode. So Scott is giving us two portrayals of, of women, one who is, is admirable and a true believer in the cause, and another who is a kind of grotesque parody of it. And if we put those two together, you know, where does the truth lie? I think that gifted Gil Fillon and his group are also genuine believers in their cause. Um, but they are rendered as stereotypes and as largely comic and incompetent. Um, and I think Scott is probably, you know, I, I quoted that passage about the object of this history is to do justice to all men. Uh, I don't think that Scott does justice to the Cameronians. Um, uh, he does acknowledge that they are true believers, but he also makes fun of them. He doesn't really attempt to uh, get to the depth of their spiritual uh, commitment. And then we need to come back to the narrator. I mean, the nar where is the narrator in, in all of this? And that brings us back to Irene's comment, which is that, uh, you know, um, he's, he's, he's a moderate English uh, perspective. Um, but go ahead, you were, do you want to say something else? Well, I, I just wanted to say, you know, if, if you look over the stretch of literature of all times, you know, Japan is another example of this period. You know, David mentioned how bloody the 17th century was. It was bloody all over the world. And sure. And people, and, and it, it, clearly it was the time of, of, of a modernization, if you will, of, of war uh, in, in a way that, that, that made it possible for it to be bloody everywhere, I guess. But, but ultimately there were the similar issues in Japan of, 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 of gods putting in place because gods, I mean, excuse me, uh, 
kings or deities or emperors or were put in place by God because that's the way it was, really. And I, I, I just wanted to come back to this notion that I'm not sure that those people who really believe they were in service to God are represented authentically in this novel. Um, and, and that, and that, that it's, a, it's a shallowing, if you will. I mean, it, it, it makes for an, a, a wonderful telling of a story to have these examples, as you, you mentioned, John. But, but I, I think that it could be a deeper question of, of what's meaning rather than self-interest and, and uh, who carries the day for influence. I wonder if there's not a deeper question of, of, of what brings meaning to their world besides who's in charge. Um, and I don't know, that, that's sort of the thing I've been ruminating about as I continue to read through. And I appreciate you listening. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would just, again, cite Flora as the example of someone who is dedicated to a higher cause and who is rendered admirable by the, the, the narrator. Um, but, but she's a woman, and this is a novel about men, as you mentioned. Um, but the, the, the men are all <laughs> self-interested, <laughs> and the women... I know, that's my point, really. The women, the women, yes. We have to think about the women. Um, and I would, uh, in, in response to what Irene said, I think Irene, uh, it, you're, you're absolutely correct about the moderate position, but I, I would suggest a slightly different wording. Rather than say that he has a moderate English perspective, I would say that he has a British perspective. That um, uh, he's, he's thinking in terms of great, a Great Britain uh, and the, the future of England and Scotland is one that is British, not English, but Irene. I was just going to say, I, was, I would agree with you because the only character so far in the novel that I thought he presented as being admirable was the minister who took his part against the, the colonel uh, and tried to talk to him and find out what, you know, what his story was. Was he guilty of these charges of treason, etc.? and then spoke up for him, he came across as the only person of faith who seemed admirable in the way in which they acted. Yes, and I, I wonder if people have um, anything further to say about that particular part of the Lowlands episode where the um, Colonel um, and Mr. Morton, Colonel, oh, what, what is, what, yes. What is the colonel's last name? I'm I'm forgetting. Does is it Melville? Um, Melville. 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 Yes, Colonel Melville and and Mr. Morton. Um. Hello, sweetheart. We're hearing you, Glenna. <laughs> Anyone um, want to comment about the? The, the scenes, it's a fairly extended scene in which um, Edward is uh, accused of having committed treason. And uh, Mr. Morton and Colonel Melville uh, discuss the question of his guilt or innocence. I know that uh, William has had his hand up for a while, and I don't know if, if you have any um, comments about this particular question, but. I didn't want to address this scene specifically, but I think what I'm going to say does touch on it. This, um, the Scots don't seem to be motivated specifically from a religious standpoint, a dogmatically religious standpoint. Uh, the way that David referred to, because they seem to be a mix of Cameronians and Coventers and Roman Catholics. And um, Lord Brand Brad Ardine is even reading the evening service from the Scottish prayer book uh, to his soldiers on the night before they go into battle. So they're a real melange of religious positions. But what seems to unite them and give, gives them the sense of fighting for a righteous cause is a Scottish nationalism that, and I'm glad, John, that you've mentioned Britishness, 
because the Scots, I think, are fighting to get a Stuart back onto the throne. They've been bullied by England since 1300, and they finally got a Stuart dynasty, a Scottish dynasty, onto the throne with James, uh, James I, well, the English James I, who was the same person as the Scottish James VI. <laughs> um, and they feel that, that, that they were cheated of that with James II being forced to, to flee um, and that they're being bullied by the English again. In fact, they're being ruled not even by English, but by Germans. The Hanoverians are brought over. Um, so I f that seems to be what's motivating them. And of course, they feel that they have the God on their side because an oath was sworn of allegiance to the Stuart dynasty, and then that was summarily broken with the Glorious Revolution. I, I, I think those, those are very apt comments. And I think that what you're, you're correct in the, the major thing uh, that you say about what unites the disparate factions is Scottish nationalism. And that this is uh, one of the things that is um, in dispute at this point that is uh, connected with the question of the monarchy and the question of who will be the king uh, is uh, what will be the future of the nation? Uh, will it be a unified Great Britain, a British state under a parliamentary rule from London, or will it be a, a Stuart monarchy that restores justice to the Scottish nation as a nation. Um, so, yes. This one true, too is still a live issue. Yes. Yes. <laughs> in a, in a post-Brexit world. Yes. But, but I, I think I mentioned last time that it's, it's useful to track the, um, the terms, uh, it, certainly Scottish and Scotland are, are everywhere. But when does English get used and when does British get used in, in this novel? And um, my, my, my feeling f about the, uh, the position that the narrator takes, and this will become clearer when we get to the third volume, is that the, the, the narrator sees that the future lies in a British state. A unified state. I know that um, Wendy has a question. Wendy. Mm -hmm. I was going to call to the back of the, uh, it's a large question here, the back of my Oxford World Classics edition of Waverley, which says that Scott invented the historical novel in its modern form, and then goes on to say he profoundly influenced the development of the European and American novel for a century at least. So my question was, in what sense is that true? I'm reading a lot of George Eliot, and Charles Dickens right now. And I don't quite understand the truth of that in relationship to them. So that's interesting to me. It's not, you know, that's a big question, obviously, just a thought seed there. But I'm also interested that it changes from invented the historical novel in its modern form to profoundly influenced the development of the European and American novel, not modifying it by historical. Those are two really different claims. Um, I think both they are they are different claims, and the emphasis that I would give to the first claim is that he invented the historical novel in its modern form. That is, uh, there were historical fictions. I mean, David mentioned Tom Jones, for example, uh, earlier. You know, an eighteenth-century novel. 
and there are historical uh, fictions, narratives, not all of them in, in prose and therefore not novels um, that Scott was familiar with and that he's building on. So to say he's, he invented the historical novel is in, in an absolute sense is not correct, but he, he invented it in its modern form. And I think that the, the claim that's being made there is uh, for his influence um, on, on James Fenimore Cooper, for example. I mean, is the, the great American historical novelist of uh, early American experience. And uh, um, clearly, Cooper was a, a great reader influenced by, by Scott and modeling his work. I will... Um, explore the connection between Scott and Dickens next time when we, we talk about that, because I think that it's a, it's a very powerful influence on Dickens. So I want to hold that in reserve. Um, other novelists in the 19th century who read Scott and admired him deeply include George Eliot. I mean, if you read The, the Mill on the Floss, uh, yeah. One of the um, things that is important there is who reads Scott, and to read Scott is to uh, 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 enter into a world of romance and, um, you know, the, the, the admiration for Flora McIver is is deep in in George Eliot, and so many heroines in nineteenth century uh, fiction are avatars of, uh, or modeled on, uh, have, have Flora as their avatar. And um, Thackeray, for example, uh, mm. uh, has a, um, um, uh, a parody of Scott called Rebecca and Rowena. And in, uh, in Rebecca and Rowena, he he's, is, um, making fun of uh, Ivanhoe. And he, he talks about the blonde heroine, who is Rowena, who is always the one who marries the hero, and Rebecca, who is the dark heroine, in, in this case, Jewish, uh, who's always sent off to the, um, to the nunnery or to, to some sort of exile or who has a, has a bad fate. And, Thackeray is in love with the dark heroine, and many novelists of the 19th century are in love with Flora and with, with the dark heroine. So there's a long feminist tradition that uh, extends through the 19th century and, and into the 20th of people who are looking back to, consciously or unconsciously, to the strong heroines in, in Scott's novels, of whom Rebecca in Ivanhoe and Flora in this novel are um, prime examples. Just quickly, uh, just last night I'm reading Silas Marner, yeah. and in this edition, there's a marvelous introduction um, by QD. Is it Levis or Levis? L e a v i s. Levis. Levis, yeah. And so she says that George Eliot's youthful enthusiasm for Scott which jumped out at me, obviously, reading Waverly at the same time. Her youthful enthusiasm for Scott had yielded at the Silas Marner period, which is 1861, yeah. to a critical view of his inadequate ideas of composition, in spite of his fertile imagination, his ability to tell his story and create characters, but somehow experience and finished faculty rarely go together. She writes, Dearly beloved Scott, says Eliot, had the greatest combination of experience and faculty, yet even he never made the most of his treasures, at least in his mode of presentation. So it was funny to read all the, you know, acknowledging her youthful infatuation with him and then having a different view as she had taken a real turn with Silas Marner and doing something very different. But it's fascinating. I love putting all these ideas together. Um, it's just so rich to share the then and the now. Yeah. Um, you know, Scott is not, 
as widely read today as he was in the 19th century. I mean, yeah. you, you have to realize that he, he was the novelist of the early 19th century um, and of the entire 19th century. He was, he was more widely read than any other novelist until Dickens. I mean, Dickens comes along and Dickens is influenced by him and um, competes with him and admires him and um, you know, becomes, if you will, the, 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 the most widely read novelist of his time. Um, There's a partial autobiography by the woman novelist about whom I did a dissertation, and she records that when she was a girl, which would have been just after Scott's death, I guess, uh, she had to limit herself strictly to one chapter of Scott a day, <laughs> because otherwise she wouldn't get anything done. <laughs> <laughs> and who was that woman? Charlotte Young. If I may, I, I would, uh, Glenna has a comment, so Glenna, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to say, and I have another reading group that started at 3.30, so I'll try and make it succinct. Um, the worldwide reach, I shouldn't say, the, certainly the Europe-wide reach, uh, Alexander Pushkin wrote this wonderful Captain's Daughter, The Captain's Daughter, uh, based it, in the early 19th century. He writes it after Scott, influenced by Scott, about the Pugachev uh, Rebellion during the time of Catherine the Great in the 18th mm -hmm. century. So there's a big literature comparing um, that novel with Scott. Russian. And then I just was thinking about this in light of the pandemic and the great Italian novel of the 19th century is The Betrothed by Alexander Manzoni. And it's set in the uh, 17th century during a plague that visited Milan. And again, there seems to be a literature comparing Manzoni to Scott. Um, the novel is The Betrothed and I read it years ago, and it's a wonderful novel. I don't think it's read enough in this country. But there you have Italy and Russia both with some of the great masterpieces of the 19th century, directly influenced by Scott. Mm -hmm. And with that, I say this has been wonderful, and I go to my next <laughs> reading group. Okay, thanks, Gwenna. And Tiger has her hand raised as well. Hi. Um, I'm grateful you mentioned um, James Fenimore Cooper, one of my great favorites. I believe it's the last of the Mohicans. There's an army officer who has two daughters, central to the novel. One is very fair and the other is quite dark. And as you read along, um, you realize, I believe they're half sisters. They have different mothers. And um, I'm also looking at Iola Leroy. And um, this comes into, into a matter of, uh, I don't know what the word is. I, I want to say ethnicity, but um, intermarriage maybe. Um, so, yeah, you ha I, I'm very grateful that you brought up James Fenimore Cooper. I want to look at that again in terms of um, what we're doing with Iola Leroy. Thank you. Uh, the question of light-skinned and dark-skinned African-Americans is an issue that comes up in that novel, Iola Leroy, and it's also present in other uh, African-American literature and literature about the African-American yeah. experience. But this is uh, the woman I'm speaking of, the dark woman, is um, a Native American, had a Native American mother. Yeah. That's, that was her history. Yeah. But, but it amounts to similar things. Just wanted to mention that. I feel excited about it now. I feel more excited about Iola Leroy. Thanks. Good. Any, any other questions out there that I don't see? Tara, are there people with hands up that uh, 
are not on my screen. Yes, Margaret. Hi, thank you. This is specific to, um, to volume two, and forgive me if you talked about it the first time, but I'm trying to understand, you know, I'm sure it was very purposeful about setting apart volume two from volume one. And um, I'm, I'm just trying to understand, is it in this, um, is volume two, volume two, because of a political progression, like he was, you know, kind of a, 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 a king in power sympathizer in, in volume one, and he's moving toward a more Jacobite um, political leaning in, in two? Is it that we've moved actually phys physically, geographically? Is that he's a little further along in his education? I just wondered if you could speak to that um, to, you know, just help me understand, because I'm sure it was quite purposeful, but I'm just, um, he wrapped these, you know, however many chapters together, and I'm just, um, I'm just trying to see it a little bit better in light of the structure of his novel. Thanks for the question. Yes, that's, I think, is, is very interesting. Um, my, uh, my belief is that uh, the novel is slow to begin. I think it's, it's a harder novel to get into at the outset and that it picks up speed. It's a faster novel. There's more action, more excitement. We get to battles. Um, uh, volume two begins with the stag hunt, which is a kind of prelude to the battle, and it concludes with the battle um, and with the death of uh, Balmawapple. And uh, shortly before that, we have the death of, of uh, Colonel Gardner, and shortly before that, we have the death of Sergeant Houghton. So um, there, there's a progression from, uh, if you will, lackadaisical tourism, <laughs> as Edward has his education and goes up into the highlands, and then uh, an increase in action as he gets uh, uh, brought closer and closer to the center of the uh, of the rebellion, and one climax of the uh, of volume two is his meeting with Bonnie Prince Charlie, with with the the Chevalier, uh, with uh, Charles Edward, and um, that's a wonderful scene for for me. It's a, it's a scene again. I was talking about father figures, and I think that the the prince is a, a candidate for one of the father figures in the novel. And his job, he's a consummate politician, and um, he's also a very skilled courtier. And when he's introduced to Edward, um, he engages him in conversation. And he's, he's exquisitely polite and charming to Edward because he sees the ways in which Edward uh, is potentially beneficial to his cause. And there's a comic moment in it too, in which he says uh, to Edward, some of my advisors say that I should retreat and others say that I should attack. Do you have an opinion? He asks Edward for his advice on the military matter. And Edward says in response, um, I don't know, I will do whatever will be of greatest use to you, uh, in, in service to you. Um, and uh, the prince's response is spoken like a Waverly. It's a comic moment because in effect, Edward is saying, I don't have any idea about what the best thing for you to do is, whether it's to advance or, re or retreat. Um, and the prince then pays Edward a compliment by appealing to his family name and says, spoken like a Waverly. But we as readers and Scott as the, the narrator can also see this is Edward, uh, again, being ignorant of what to do in the historical situation. Um, but what then follows is that the prince says, um, I want you to take this sword. And he gives him a sword and it's uh, a, an, an heirloom, and, and Edward accepts the sword. 
And this is what, this is something that Fergus didn't quite manage to get Edward to do. Fergus wants Edward to become a son of Ivor. He wants him to become a Mac Ivor. And Edward demurs. Edward says, no, I have to go back to England and clear my name and, and complete my resignation from the English army before I can join the cause officially. So, you know, Fergus is saying, darn it, I missed, I almost, I almost got him to, to sign on. Um, and it's at that point that Fergus says, oh, okay, if you're going to go back to England, let me give you my horse and I'll send Callum Begg with you. Because he knows that as soon as Edward gets into the lowlands, he's going to get captured as a, um, a Highland accomplice or, or, uh, or spy. Um, and um, th th there are actually some more complicated things that happen because it turns out that the people who capture Edward from gifted Gil Fillen are not Mac Ivor. They're not Fergus's men. They belong to someone else. And uh, um, they're Donald Bain Lane and Donald Bain Lane's uh, uh, people, but uh, they don't seem to be in the service of, of Fergus. But anyway, notice how, how um, Edward is getting closer and closer to signing on to the, um, to the Jacobite cause. And the scene in the other scene that is a, uh, um, a very important scene in volume two is the scene with Major Melville and Mr. Morton that I was asking about before. And notice the way that that's set up as a legal process. It's, it's in effect a trial in which Major Melville is performing the role of judge and also prosecutor. He says, here is all the evidence, and I'm asked to judge whether you are, um, in fact, guilty of treason. And all of the evidence points to the conclusion that you are guilty. But I will defer the judgment. Instead, I'm going to send you under guard uh, to England where you can be, can be judged. And Mr. Morton is the defense attorney. And uh, what's being conducted here is a legal process. And this goes back to the question that I raised um, from volume one about the difference between uh, and black as a way of settling disputes. That Scott is really, and the narrator, uh, Scott's narrator, are really on the side of, of the law. The law is a better way to settle disputes and to settle questions of justice. Then, uh, and Scott is interested as a as a man of the law in the question of circumstantial evidence, and you know Edward is so lucky. He he's incredibly lucky. Um, there's all this evidence against him, but he has not technically joined the rebellion. He is still innocent in a legal sense despite all the circumstantial evidence that has been mounted against him. And this will, you know, we, we have to wait until volume three, but um, volume three will determine how Edward is judged when he, when and if uh, he comes to uh, a, a, a trial. But one of the things I would point out about, I mean, Scott is working in the tradition of uh, the, three volume novel. That's the standard form for uh, novels to be published in, in the 19th century. So his decision about what to include in each volume and how to end each volume is very important. If you go back and look at the end of volume one, the last chapter, it concludes with Edward falling asleep. Um, Edward is a very sleepy protagonist. He sleeps more than just about any protagonist uh, in a 19th century novel. And he, he, he does things like sprain his ankle um, or get um, knocked around at the stag hunt. And he has to be put into a stretcher and carried. And 
there are lots of ways in which Edward is not, in, in which our hero, as the narrator repeatedly calls him, <laughs> is not heroic. He's a witness to history rather than a participant in it. But in volume two, instead of being a tourist and just a, an observer, uh, he's getting closer and closer and closer to being a participant. He's trying to resign his, uh, um, his position in the English army. Um, he's, there's all this circumstantial evidence. He's accepted the sword from, from the prince. Um, he's, he's right at the point uh, of signing on. And he even goes into battle. And uh, so volume two concludes, if, if you look at the last two chapters of volume two, um, the penultimate chapter of vol volume two, which is on the eve before the battle, ends with Edward falling asleep <laughs> again. Um, but it doesn't end Volume one ends with Edward asleep. Volume two ends with the series of uh, violent actions that are part of the Battle of Preston Pens and with the death of, of uh, Captain Gardner and Colonel Gardner and of Balma Weppel. Um, and before that, the death of Sergeant Houghton and Sergeant Houghton is, a, is an important figure in, in the novel because Edward may not be guilty technically of having joined the rebellion. That's, it's, you know, all the circumstantial evidence points to his having joined it, but he has not officially uh, done so because he hasn't resigned his, um, his position in, in the army, for one thing. Um, but the death of Sergeant Houghton points to something else that Edward is guilty of, which is that he has led a battalion of English soldiers into battle. And as a result, they have uh, one of them, uh, 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 someone from Sir Everard's estate, has, has been killed. So Edward is, is guilty of having betrayed His, his followers, uh, the Englishman who joined him. And that, the betrayal of Sergeant Houghton, who calls out to him and says, oh, is it, is it the, young, the young man from, from, uh, from Waverly Honor? Uh, uh, is it the, the young gentleman? I forget exactly the, the phrase that, that he uses. And it's his English voice and his English accent. And the word English is really stressed there that calls out to Edward and gets him to recognize uh, his Englishness. This is, this is a place where I think Edward's Englishness is most, uh, most prominent. And the, the narrator may be British, but Edward there is, is certainly an Englishman. And um, so volume two differs from volume one in both the pace of action and in the way in which Edward is great, more greatly involved in the action. And the question of whether our hero is a hero or not, I think is something else that we should address. What exactly does Edward do that is heroic, um, that is evidence of his, if you will, valor in a, in a traditional sense of heroism? And, I would propose that he does one thing in volume two that is heroic. And it's in the encounter where he takes the Englishman prisoner. Um, there's a battle. Edward has a, is, uh, is in battle with an English officer whose ax or sword breaks. And Edward then says, you are my captive. This is the traditional honorable thing in, that a gentleman does in battle. So uh, that becomes that, that uh, English officer becomes Edward's personal um, captive. And it's an act of mercy rather than an act of violence. 
And that's, I think, Edward's strongest claim to be um, our hero. But golly, we're out of time. Um, it's three o'clock, so we have to end. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, for uh, listening to David and me and for accompanying us um, through volume two. And I have um, a couple of questions I'll leave you with. One is I want to ask you what it's like to read a novel that has poetry in it. Um, and the other is to think about minor characters in the novel. Um, I'm interested in particular in the Baron of Bradwardine and Davy Galatly. Um, so I hope we can talk about them and talk about uh, the relationship between Scott and Dickens when we meet next month. So goodbye and thank you again. See you next month. Thank you. Thank you, John. Bye. Thank you, John. Thank you, David. <laughs>